Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Bai. I'm the Director of Programming at MCA Denver, and welcome to this first in our four-part series on Keith Haring that we are producing in conjunction with the current exhibition, Keith Haring, Grace House Murals. MCA is coming to you live every Wednesday throughout the run of our exhibitions, and you can check out all the great programming that we have coming up at mcadenver.org slash events. We are thrilled to be able to present this programming during the pandemic, and we are thrilled that you can join us, but it takes a lot to put it together. If you have the means, please consider donating to support MCA Denver. We suggest a donation of $10, which is what we would normally charge for tickets, but any amount helps. Thank you so much for your support. Today we present Keith Herring's Stairwell to Grace. I am pleased to welcome our host to this four-part series, Carlo McCormick. Carlo is an American culture critic, a writer, and a curator living in New York City. Please welcome Carlo McCormick. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah, and, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, I'm going to come back in a, in a little bit to uh, talk a bit about the stairwell and art because that's a kind of a major architectural component of Keith's uh, murals at Grace House. But right now, I, I really want to, uh, to introduce you to uh, Gil Fernandez, uh, Velasca, sorry, I'm spacing out. Um, and uh, Gil is a director of the Keith Herring Foundation which was established to uh, preserve and kind of grow Keith's legacy as, uh, as a person and as an artist. Um, Gil was close friends with Keith and a, and a confidant, so we're very fortunate to have him share uh, his experiences and, and his kind of intimate knowledge of, of Keith. He's also a really wonderful guy, and. Uh, so uh, I'm really happy to say, uh, please welcome uh, Gil, Gil Velasquez. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carlo, and thanks to the MCA Denver for the warm welcome uh, and to the Herring Foundation staff for the assist. Uh, I wanna talk a little, bit, a little bit about Keith Herring. I brought some, uh, some slides. You know, it is well known that Keith came to New York in the late 70s, enrolled in the School of Visual Arts, found his tribe, and went on to become one of the artists that defined his era. Uh, while he borrowed some of the ethos of leaning into pop culture and relishing fame from his mentor, Andy Warhol, his guiding principles were a combination of generosity and service to others. Uh, whether it was drawing on empty subway advertisement panels with chalk uh, to bring art to the people that would not otherwise uh, go to a museum or gallery or creating art to compel people to heed a pertinent message like act up for life or free South Africa or crack is whack. Uh, the common thread was his desire to improve life for others. Uh, the murals on your screen uh, are works that Keith created for various hospitals, schools, daycare centers, and shelters. And the Grace House mural falls into that category. Uh, the Grace House was uh, a safe place, a sort of a refuge for teen kids. Uh, that were likely to otherwise find trouble if they ran amok on the streets. So I look forward to uh, discussing how the mural came to be, uh, its uh, recent history, and where we are now. And that's my spiel. Wow. Thanks, Gil. It's always so cool to see that. Keith was so prolific. You think you know what he's done, and then you see all the other things he did. 
it's really great. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about uh, staircases, which is a kind of obscure subject. I hope you'll put up with it. Uh, but it's really interesting uh, how it functions for these murals, which are now at the MCA Denver, and and sort of uh, as a stage that runs through art. And I'm going to show a lot of movie slides because Keith was uh, uh, very much a populist. So I thought if I put up images that everyone recognizes, it would be a, 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 maybe a little more entertaining than than art history. Are we ready for the slides yet? Oh, super cool. So I wanted to start really with uh, Grace House. So you can see uh, uh, the murals in situ. If I'm doing this right, we're kind of ascending the staircase, but uh, someone told me I had it backwards, so we're maybe descending. Um, but anyway, you can see how it works and how we work with the architectural elements, the dancing figures, and, and um, you know, imagine perhaps You've been dancing all night and just coming out of your K hole and, and climbing the stairs. Uh, so that I wanted you to see that, and then we can look at uh, how it goes on. If you want to go next slide, I guess. So this just uh, struck me. Uh, next one, yeah, there we go. Uh, this uh, struck me be because it was something I had uncovered. We were just celebrating. Uh, I think it was in '99. The uh, centenary of uh, Bauhaus. And this was the second Bauhaus in Dessau. And Oscar Schlemmer, uh, who was the kind of choreographer, uh, theater uh, teacher there, he did this in the staircase of the Gropius Design Building. It's a great moment of modernism. And, and again, it, it is like the dancing figures, uh, uh, just you know, beautiful design and, and, and really energized uh, uh, how we think of movement and space, uh, which is what stairs get to and what Keith was very much about movement. Uh, maybe keep going then. And then this is um, uh, done just a few years later. It's Oscar Schlemmer again. And this is called Bauhaus Staircase. So in a way, it harkens to the fact that he had done the uh, uh, that stairwell painting for the Bauhaus, but again, but if you if you look in the upper left corner, you can kind of see the dancing figure again, and you also have this sense because they're walking up and their backs are to us of this kind of passage of time, and it's a really melancholic painting. It's up at MoMA if anyone ever gets to see it, because he's really uh, responding to the news uh, that the Bauhaus was going to close. They had left uh, Dessau because the Nazi party took uh, <clears throat> power there. And then as the Nazis kind of took over Germany, their, their days were numbered and, and they shut down the institution. So it, it, it's kind of filled with that. I think it's just a beautiful painting. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so uh, Schlemmer certainly would have, have known of this work. It was such a... a a scandal. Uh, it was actually originally a flop. Uh, when he did it and showed it in Paris, the Cubists didn't like it and the Futurists didn't like it for its kind of hybridity with them. I'm talking about the image on the right. On the left is sort of a, you know a take on it, uh, which is to show to show really that it was a motion study, and it is about that motion. And it, it, you, it, uh, I think one American critic at the time uh, said it was like an explosion in the shingle factory. But uh, you, you get that sense of dynamism in here, and uh, it, it kind of uh, alerted all the American artists, uh, as Glackens at the time put it, uh, the, the, how provincial we had been, that we had kind of missed uh, the rise of modernism and the avant-garde in Europe, and, and uh, it, it forever changed uh, America when, when it was shown here at the Armory Show in 1913. Let's keep going. Oh, yeah, I love this one. Uh, there are so many ways to think of staircases. This is called Kunstkick, and it's by Chris Burden, who uh, did put himself at risk many times for his art, including most famously uh, being shot in the shoulder for a piece. But this is where he's kicked down a staircase. Uh, you can definitely see the, the figure on the top there uh, with a the foot, and he's being kicked down the staircase. 
And it's from, I think, 74. Let me look. Yeah, 74. But what's funny is that it's at Basel and it's at Art Basel. So if you think about Art Basel now or any art fair and how it's a kind of privileged place of rich people buying uh, very expensive baubles, uh, it's great that, you know, back in the 70s, they were allowing really radical performance art as part of the dialogue. Uh, let's keep going. Okay, uh, this is called uh, Trump Descending an Escalator. <clears throat> it's from 2017, uh, the Golden Escalator, uh, the kind of famous moment of uh, Trump's uh, arrival into uh, the presidential race. And it's by Dana Schutz, who's a really great painter, um, who does tackle uh, provocative and, and sometimes problematic subject matter uh, she got, uh, there was a lot of uh, trouble was raised when she showed a painting of Emmett Till in his coffin, which was done very much as a public act by the mother to, because after his lynching, she wanted people to see what they had done to her kid. But there was a, a lot of people had problems with the fact that a, a, a white person all these years later were doing it. Anyway, I love this one and hopefully it's not too controversial. Let's keep going. Okay, so this is uh, this one. I hope people recognize it's it's one of the the most uh, most reproduced works. It was his most popular print by M. C. Escher, and it's called Relativity. So if you think that like we were hopefully uh, sending the staircases as uh, we did with Schlemmer and Herring, and then uh, descending it as we did with Duchamp and um, and Chris Burden and Dana Schutz. This is sort of like up and down all over. And let this keep going. So th those are the staircases as subject. Uh, it, Keith didn't make the staircases subject, uh, but this brings it kind of the idea of the in situ thing. This is one of uh, Diego Rivera's greatest murals, and that's quite a number to choose from. Uh, this is at the, the National Palace in Mexico City. Uh, it's really overwhelming uh, uh, if you ever get a chance to see it, but it, it's very much framed by the stairway. And it, it's interesting in a way to talk about it in relation to Keith, because murals were uh, very much uh, an art form of the Renaissance from the early through the late Renaissance into the Baroque. Then they kind of uh, peter out as, as art becomes more of, uh, something for less public spaces and more for uh, rich private homes. But uh, Diego then becomes the kind of missing link to what, you know, we have the WPA murals and then Keith really, uh, and the birth of street art uh, that Keith helped usher in. Uh, so it's important to know that Rivera, the reason his work isn't as, uh, as brutal, uh, as violent, as someone like uh, Orozco or Rufino Tamayo, the other great Mexican muralist, was because uh, Rivera was in Italy at the time of the revolution. Uh, he was over there making sketches of Renaissance murals. So he kind of really takes from the source material and brings it back to uh, mural culture uh, much later. Uh, let's keep going. And then this is another uh, amazing staircase piece by an artist quite celebrated for his mural art, J.R. And this is uh, part of a, a series he did uh, called Women Are Heroes in Sao Paulo, Brazil, in the favelas. And it was, it, it was a, the very simple, very humanist notion that for all the poverty and struggling of this incredibly poor area, uh, it was the women who kept the families together. It was the women who were witness to the conditions. And uh, it's just a beautiful tribute. Uh, it actually is probably the piece uh, that made J.R. the very famous artist he is today. It's the one that launched him. And because he was also really uh, early in understanding how when you do uh, this kind of ephemeral public art, it's all about the photograph. And, and the things he did in the favelas with all the eyes and the faces, uh, it, it really is a great photographic tableau. So uh, let's keep going now. Oh, and then, okay, so to wrap up the uh, my little art history talk here, uh, 
this is a, a, a probably, it's not the most famous painting by any means, but it's one of the most reproduced Rembrandt paintings. It's in the Louvre. It's uh, the philosopher, what's it called? Um, philosopher in Meditation uh, from 1632. And it's, it's reproduced so much because it, anytime any popular website or something like that wants to do a story on the esoteric or on philosophy, it's kind of like the go-to <clears throat> image for that. And I, and I thought it'd be nice to end the art part of this talk with this notion of the staircase as something that ascends in thought, but also kind of digs down in contemplation. And so now I'm gonna show you some movie stills. This is, I think the, you know, uh, the greatest staircase scene uh, ever. Uh, and there, there, you'll see there, there's many to, to consider, but uh, this is Eisenstein's battleship Potemkin uh, as the scene shot on the Odessa steps which is uh, a massacre, right? And you can see all the people there, but there's a moment there where a mother is, is killed and, and lets go of the baby carriage and you follow the baby carriage down. And this is, you know, film history 101, one of the great uh, scenes of all time. And I'll look up the year because I'm so bad at this stuff. Uh, that's 1925. Uh, let's keep going to, to stay with the, the great cliches. Uh, this, uh, uh, is from um, the Victor Fleming film, uh, Vivian Lee descending the staircase in, uh, oh, I can't even say it, Gone with the Wind, um, a very problematic film. Let's go to the next one because th this is maybe the more famous one. Uh, that's Clark Gable taking Vivian Lee up the stairs uh, at the end of the movie. And, uh, you know, it, it, it seems due justice at the time, but it basically is a, a man uh, who's about to rape a woman. So uh, beyond its issues of race, uh, there's some other uh, issues with that movie. Uh, let's keep going. Oh, yes. So uh, this is the great Billy Wilder movie, uh, Sunset Boulevard from 1950. Uh, probably a, a landmark of noir film uh, above most any other. But this is, again, the, the, the stairs play a, a big role in the movie. Uh, but this is at the end where uh, uh, Gloria Swanson, who is Norma Desmond in this movie, famously, uh, it, it has killed, you know, it, she's murdered uh, the guy who narrates the film because it starts with him dead in the pool. Uh, and uh, her butler uh, kind of, got, you know, the way they coax her down to be arrested is because there are all these cameramen there. It's it's really like her press moment because she's a forgotten uh uh, grand star of the silent screen and this is 1950 so it's kind of the end of her career and and she has that great line uh, i'm ready for my close-up mr demille which i hope some of you remember let's uh, go on to the next okay uh i don't know if this is actually from the film uh, but this is uh, uh so if the first if the first ones I showed were kind of about the staircase as a kind of stage as a very theatrical um, uh, a bit of interstitial space um, the uh, this is the staircase really almost as a character in and of itself from James Car Cameron's uh, you know mighty uh, epic uh, Titanic uh, big blockbuster and and here we kind of consider how the staircase um, demarks class. Uh, think of the old, you know, America was shown a masterpiece theater, I think it was Channel 5 in England, upstairs, downstairs. The upstairs being the, uh, you know, the wealthy people downstairs being their servants. So this is, uh, you know, everyone's seen the movie. I don't need to blather on about it. Let's, let's keep going. And uh, this is maybe the most obscure, but it was it was certainly was an award winning movie of its time. It uh, definitely impacted me very much as a kid. It was 1967, and it was called Up the Down Staircase. And in it, Sandy Dennis uh, plays a, a liberal, white, uh, well intentioned school teacher who goes to teach in a New York City public school, which is uh, with what we might call at-risk kids today. Uh, 
and and much more racially diverse than than her background and the stairs are kind of a a a, a moment of terror for her because she's kind of unprotected and and i think artists have always been interested in interstitial spaces in uh these kind of liminal points uh, uh and and stairs function really great for that let's keep going Oh, this is kind of dark, but this is, again, it's like a, stair a staircase as almost a character in the film, as, as a kind of topography that divides class. Again, if uh, anyone saw that big Academy Award winning uh, hit, uh, Parasite, if you remember the the, the character, the family, basically it becomes this whole family are living uh, kind of down below uh, by the water in a place that gets flooded and it's you know really squalid thing. And uh, they kind of infiltrate the lives of, a, of an affluent family. And this is the staircase that uh, he kind of traverses to go between these two worlds. Okay. And then, uh, you know, Hitchcock uh, just was great with staircases. He was kind of uh, great with, uh, with height, with, with uh, um, how do I say it? Uh, the, I guess he had acrophobia. Uh, of it. Uh, so this is from Vertigo, but if you, if you think, and so imagine a character who, who suffers from Vertigo having to walk these staircases and, uh, and it's also, uh, he, he understood uh, the nature of the cliffhanger. Uh, it's kind of dramatic uh, thing. So, you know, you have people hanging off the Statue of Liberty or off of Mount Rushmore in different films like North, North by Northwest and stuff like that. So he kind of understood that uh, as a kind of psychological space of terror. Let's keep going. And then, uh, you know, so we've been going down, we've been going up and, and this is kind of the, uh, the, the, the stairway uh, of, of infinite possibilities. This is, uh, is from, uh, I'm sure many of you recognize it from one of the Harry Potter films. Let's see, uh, The Prisoner of Azkaban. But it's the stairs with kind of a mind of their own. Like you get on them and they take you to your room. They're constantly shifting and uh, maybe a little like the M.C. Escher uh, print we saw earlier. Let's keep going. And then uh, one of the great, uh, you know, staircase scenes of all time, uh, like Parasite, it's also from 2019. Uh, and it's the Joker kind of, dancing down this Dante Dante-esque sort of uh entry into into madness uh, and it, it's this uh you know uh, not exactly an easy hollywood blockbuster more a, a study of madness and uh and, and i think Todd Phillips did a really good job bringing that out let's keep going uh, okay so uh and then this would be back up the stairs again uh the aspirational steps uh, it was really actually hard to find this image because if you if you Google it, it, all you get is like everyone's done a selfie on these steps. But this is the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and this is Rocky in training. You know, I, I'm not going to sing the theme song for you, I promise. But uh, you know, kind of going up the steps, and he ends up on the top of the steps of uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and his arms exultantly raised. Uh, let's keep going. Okay, so this is the, the last one. It's from a 1946 movie called A Matter of Life and Death, uh, which was a very interesting uh, British-American collaboration started during World War II, uh, very publicly that way, that they were going to work together um, because this was just kind of uh, thinking of uh, the war effort as well. And uh, <clears throat> in it, David Niven plays this pilot who, you know, shot down, crashes, dies, but there's a screw up in heaven and the angel never gets him. So he ends up living and uh, falls in love. And then they come to get him and he's like, well, you can't do that to me because, you know, look what's happened since then. And so this is kind of the culmination of it. It was a masterwork of special effects because it's an escalator going up to heaven. Uh, um you know, the, the, the kind of defining of it between these, these two worlds. Uh, and um, in America, the movie was released as Stairway to Heaven, uh, which, of course, Led Zeppelin used. But I was thinking of, of this movie uh, when, uh, when we uh, named this talk uh, 
all of us together. So that's it. And if you hold on a second, we'll bring Gil back on. And I know I have questions to ask him, but hopefully uh, you do as well, because it's really a rare opportunity to to speak to Gil uh, and to get his insights and wisdom uh, and experiences uh, knowing Keith so well and now uh, running his foundation. <laughs> Hey, Gil. I really enjoyed Hello. your talk. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Listen, I, I wanted to, uh, I know you're not a, a big social media guy, uh, but I wanted to clarify that uh, I did not establish the Keith Herring Foundation. Oh, no, you did. I'm sorry. Did I say Keith, that? Sorry. No, no, you didn't. But it was on, it was on social media as part oh, of, yeah. you know, as part of the promotion that I established it. Uh, uh, listen, that couldn't be further from the truth. At the time that Keith asked me to be, uh, on the board of his foundation. I had no idea what a foundation was, what a foundation did, uh, but I have since uh, learned quite a bit since then. <laughs> yeah. so I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, and you yeah, you were, uh, you know, before actually becoming director, you were part of that foundation for 30 years, right? Yeah, 31 years. Uh, he asked me to be on the board in 1989. And again, you know, I, I didn't really know what it would entail. Uh, but the basic gist of it was to carry out his wishes and, and protect his legacy. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to do that as, as part of my everyday. So, yeah. And I mean, his wishes are, are really distinct. Uh, he was not trying to set up a museum. He wasn't trying to do a lot of the th ways which artists uh, think of posterity. As I remember, uh, he he wanted uh, the kind of whatever profits the foundation could produce to go to AIDS charities and, and to children. Uh, he was very interested in children. He was very interested in children. Uh, obviously, you know, he wanted us to promote his art and, and spread the spread the word of, of Keith Haring and his art. Uh, but also was, you know, very interested in, in the end of HIV and, and wanted us to pursue uh, that. So we, we support organizations that uh, are involved in that, that do that, that work that is still, you know, that is, that are, are still doing that work. And children, of course, my goodness, he was, uh, I feel he was a, a, a child himself. There was a, a part of him that did not let go of childhood. Uh, yeah. The wonder of it, the, the, the discovery of, of childhood, <clears throat> it was something that was very, that he was still very close to, that he hadn't unlearned. Yeah, and you and you kind of see that in in, in artists. Picasso has that great line, uh, something effective. Uh, you know, all children are great artists. A trick for an artist is how to stay being a child. And and Keith that really manifested exactly right. that as, as well as anyone uh, that way. Indeed. Uh, we I think I don't see comments here, so uh, uh, maybe Cheyenne or, or Sarah can tell me if I'm missing any. But but before we get to any other questions people may have, I do kind of want to um, bring up this almost uh, schizophrenic relationship that an artist uh, like Keith would have uh, with his extreme generosity and then trying to navigate the marketplace. I remember, oh, I was probably not long after... Uh, Keith died. Uh, the Queens Museum in New York did a, a herring show. You probably didn't know that history better than me, Gil. But uh, I did a panel or whatever, a talk with Jeffrey Deitch, who, of course, worked mm -hmm. with uh, Keith a great deal. And I don't know what I said, but Jeffrey kind of turned to me and schooled me on the spot. And he goes, no, no, Keith knew exactly what he was doing. And we were all telling him just the opposite. We were saying, Keith, uh, stop giving your art away for free. Stop uh, tagging everyone's black books and doing drawings on their clothes and 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 selling T-shirts and all this stuff like that. The way the art market works is you act it's supply and demand like any other capitalist venture, and you don't make that much work and you kind of control the market. Uh, don't be so prolific and don't be so generous. Uh, you know, make 10 paintings for a show in New York and 10 for one in Asia and maybe 10 for, well, you know, one in uh, in Europe or something like that. Right. But like, you know, keep your output to that because you're, you're, you're flooding the market and it's, it's difficult to get what your work is worth. 
to which Keith, who knew, he had smart people like Jeffrey, he had many smart people in his in his ear. He responded by opening the pop shop. You know, so, <laughs> so I, right. I mean, I, scarcity I, scarcity is is in a sense a a tenet of of uh, the art market, right? Not so much the artist. Uh, and Keith, you know, was prolific. You know, what he was able to accomplish in his ten or eleven year career, you know, people spend you know 70 or 80 uh making as much work as he did uh so maybe he was you know i don't think that he was uh mindful of 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 uh the amount of work he was doing i think i think he was just going with it i mean he he was he needed to paint i mean my goodness he was needed to paint needed to draw yeah and i mean did you did you or or did you hear either have conversations with him at that time or, or talk to people who did about what he was thinking of the market and, and in relation to his, his kind of compulsion to. Well, to I, I think, work. I think Keith wanted, he wanted to be thought of, he wanted to be highly thought of as an artist. So what that entails is quote unquote, playing the game, right? Uh, he played the game, but, you know, he, he was also extremely generous and he uh, wanted to do murals and he wanted to uh, have, he wanted people to have access to his art. He didn't want it to be scarce. He wanted it to be out there a lot. Uh, so there was, there was a, a balance. Uh, he, he realized that there was a, a, a balance, but you know, he did it, he did it his way. Yeah. But, and, and with a real, you know, it's not just, people it's it's the people like the vox populi he really cared about uh, um uh in a very democratic way and i remember him saying that like well you know if i have a painting in in moma in new york certain number of get of people get to see it maybe but uh that's not nearly as many as walk by my work in the subway every day and and i think that really mattered to him um, yeah, absolutely. I, I always, I always think of uh, the subway drawings as, as the, you know, the ultimate sort of foundation of his career. Uh, it was, it was, you know, like you say, uh, the democratization of, of art. Him being generous and him wanting to, to give it to the people. Um, yeah, and and like many artists. Uh, of that time, I think everyone was really inspired by the masterworks that the graffiti artists were doing on the trains. And you saw a, a number of artists uh, like Keith translate their studio practice to the streets and, and really uh, kind of kick, kick forward the, the, the street art movement of, of Banksy and Shepard Ferry and, and all the rest right now. Uh, right, I mean, he, uh, he was definitely uh, very mindful and aware that these subway drawings were not permanent, right? Like these things were not going to exist forever, uh, you know. And of course, he he felt, uh, you know, he felt badly when people started to cut them out of out of uh, their frames in the subway, and and it just got to a point where he had to stop doing them. Yeah, um, you I mean, know, he made he made his point. He he yeah. got what he wanted to across with them, and then it just got to a point that he couldn't do it anymore because well, uh, they were being uh, sort of taken out of their context, which is an interesting conversation. We're here talking about the Grace House mural, and the Grace House mural existed as a as something that was uh, done for the benefit of kids, you know, teen kids. The Grace House was kind of a, uh, like a refuge, like a, a, a getaway uh, for kids. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a dark, drab sort of place uh, when it was intact. And Benny Soto, who I believe is in the audience, uh, shouts to him, uh, asked Keith to come and, do a mural, come paint on the walls. Uh, and at the time, I believe a gentleman named Gary Mellon was the director there and was very liberal and sure, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Keith. And came, you know, Keith came with a, uh, some paint and just 
drew and just painted these figures in action and and uh, up the stairs and and it was almost as if the figures that he drew were the kids that inhabited the grace house you know it was almost like portraits of them in a way uh, all the action that you could imagine when a bunch of teens are hanging out at a place like that so yeah. that that is the that is the 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 genesis of that you know it, it, it the spirit of it uh, was generosity. It, it was uh, it was a gift from Keith to these kids. Yeah, that's great. You got to talk to Benny about that. Uh, I got to see Keith paint a few times because uh, he did a bunch of murals downtown. And, you know, we didn't have the internet then, but word would spread and be like, oh, Keith is doing the, the Bowery Wall, the wall on Bowery and Houston there. He, right. he did the one right by where I live on Avenue D at that school there. Uh, and uh, which was after that. I think the Bowery Wall was kind of his first big mural, as I remember. Um, but what was phenomenal, the, the people I don't think can get right now just looking at his work or at pictures of it, was he never worked off of sketches. He never sketched anything out ahead of time. He'd literally start almost anywhere he happened to be on the on the wall and just would go from there and just – uh, remarkably, it would be perfect compositions. I don't know how he had that fluidity and that and that uh, just that kind of inner map uh, where he could freestyle. Really, you know, he's like totally riffing, and then it just it it was also perfect and really fast. I mean, and the scale the scale didn't matter. Yeah. I mean, if the guy yeah. was painting, you know, the the Necker Hospital, which is a you know a multi story staircase, it, it didn't matter. He was up there, and he'd never stood back to to watch you know, or to see what he was you know where he was in terms of scale and distance he just was on it yeah the, the, uh, the staircase that you're talking about is the first slide if, if uh you want to go back uh sarah yeah it's called the necker hospital there we go there, it is. there we go the one yeah. on the left there uh, uh, children's uh, the necker hospital. hospital yeah yeah it was a children's hospital and and again he he you know he painted that in order to I mean, could you imagine the, the, the experience of a, of a child having to go to a hospital? Uh, it's probably a really scary place for a kid, uh, especially if somebody, you know, if the kid has a serious condition, uh, there could be a lot of uh, sort of intimidating um, experiences that you would go through there. So to be able to see that uh, in a way is, is very healing. And I think, I think uh, Keith was very mindful of that and wanted to create a healing, uh, joyful experience for a kid that was visiting the Necker Hospital. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's a kind of a crime that hospitals have the worst art because art is the most healing thing. And it is. Um, the, there's a really great organization based out of New York, Art Rx, which tries to get artists, uh, you know, really good artists uh, to, to do work in hospitals, um, we, you know, which is really good. Well, good. I, I still. Yeah, I mean, my goodness, Keith. Keith was, you know, again, it, you know, the amount of, and, and you know, what we showed you in the slides is just a fraction of, of yeah. the kinds of things he did I've, in terms of. I've got a question here kids. from uh, uh, Derek uh, Simon. Thank you, Derek. Uh, he says, "I've often heard people scoff at artists who had have a minimalist, simplistic art style. What is it about Keith's work that made it resonate with so many people, let alone the art world?" That's a good question. <laughs> if we knew the answer, there'd be many more great artists like Keith. But uh, maybe you have uh, you have something. To I think I think I think uh, the art world could be intimidating, uh, and Keith's simplicity made it very accessible. It made art very accessible. It didn't make it this sort of elite thing that you had to know things about and there was a certain etiquette and you could only see it in certain places. I think the simplicity of it or the deceptive yeah. simplicity of it uh, made it very accessible. And, and I think that is what made, made it resonate uh, to mm -hmm. people. Yeah, and, and I, I think uh, deceptive being a key word here because uh, in terms of his process and his thinking, it was actually very complex and, and nuanced. Uh, it's important to, to realize that, uh, you know, 
Uh, much as he's a natural talent, he did go to SVA, and at SVA he was exposed to a, kind of a branch of philosophy that was just beginning to infect the art world at that time, which was semiotics. So Keith really understood the, the you know, how his iconography could kind of work in a landscape of signs, and, and how uh, you know, kind of post Marshall McLuhan, how how he could convey things that way. So um, it, it was. It was a, it was a uh, complex way to get to a very simple uh, uh, mode of address. That's good. All right. Oh, here's a good one uh, from Daniela Archer. What music did Keith like? Keith liked tons of different music. Uh, he liked classical. He liked Sade. He liked Public Enemy. Uh, he liked Tracy Chapman. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, the range was so great. I mean, my goodness, you know, Man Parish, you know, he liked punk. He liked house music, the stuff that Larry Levan would play at the Paradise Garage. Uh, the, the, you know, at the, the 80s at the time, my God, there were so many different things that were clashing musically. Uh, punk, hip hop, uh, you know, the pop music of the time was, was super cool. You know, you had your Prince and your Madonna and your and Michael Madonna. Jackson and stuff yeah. like that. And so lots of really, films. really amazing stuff happening at the time. Yeah. I mean, I was actually just uh, talking about this the other day because we're going to do a program on dance with, with Muna, who you know, who, who Keith collaborated with, but also some uh, young dancers uh, out of uh, the, the Denver area. And they were asking about music. And, and what I was thinking about was, of course, with the house and Larry Levan, Levan being, you know, kind of a go-to thing. That what people don't realize is that Larry had a really eclectic, really what we call Catholic taste, really broad, and that he'd kind of you know studied under David Mancuso, who did the Loft, which was the kind of the birth of the underground dance scene in New York, and that it would be hippie music would be in there, anything could be in there. This as yeah. long as people just couldn't stop dancing, and it was this incredible sense of the mix, which was something that was really. Uh, whatever club it was a mud club in New York or whatever. It was like, it was kind of postmodernist pastiche before we ha had a, a sense of it. So I do love that, that he had that. We all had that. <laughs> yeah. And those, you know, and the, the, the clubs at the time were church. Yeah. For lack of a better word, it was, it was community and it was, it was uh, congregating and it was music and, and, you know, it, it had a lot to do with, with, community and lots of creative people being in the same place at the same time. Yeah. And I, and I'd actually thought uh, a little bit about paradise garage. I almost put a slide of it in because uh, that was an incredibly democratic place. Everyone paid, everyone got in. Uh, but uh, it, it was an old garage, right? And it was a huge entrance ramp. It was like, you know, kind of like what you would drive a car up. Uh, it would be where the people would line to get up. And I, so I almost showed that ramp as part of this and, right. You know, but whatever. Okay, we have another one here. Um, thank uh, from Nora. Yay, Nora, we love you. Uh, th uh, thank you for your riveting conversation, Carlo and Gil. Can you discuss the role of dance performance as a muse for Keith? Oh, that's good. Well, Keith would often he would often depict uh, b boys. In his figures, right? So you'd see a lot of dancing figures uh, that were, you know, static but in motion. Uh, he would draw these little sort of movement lines around his figures, so they always seem to be in motion. Uh, the other, the other aspect of dance uh, uh, that Keith really delved into, you know, it, it was it, the painting. Was was like a dance. Him 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 painting was was a performance. Uh, you know that aspect of of Keith's work. Uh, you know very early on when he was at the Mud Club and doing these crazy you know doing this crazy poetry and putting you know TVs on his head and and reciting yeah, the club stuff. Yeah, and shows were great. You know, and and finally what it what it evolved into was painting but painting as a, a, as a performance. So in, in a sense, it, it was a dance. 
Yeah, and I, I think it, uh, it it also has a lot to do uh, with his interest in the body. Um, figurative art had not been, you know, kind of around for all that long when when uh, the '80s kind of busted it open as as a kind of a dominant thing. We we had been through, you know, uh, of course, minimalism and things like that. But also, uh, you know most famously abstract expressionism. And you get that sense with the gestures, Jackson Pollock kind of dancing around the canvas and stuff like that. But I think he was very interested in the body and interested in, as, a, as a kind of political space. Uh, and I think that really had a lot to do with uh, what he thought about the kind of ecstatic and liberating qualities that, that uh, dance presented. Uh, this is from Mood of Collapse. Do you have a favorite herring artwork or theme? Be the dancing figures or radiant baby, et cetera. Hmm. Do you have one, uh, Carlo? I, I actually don't. Uh, I, I've never been very good at playing favorites. People sometimes ask me my favorite <laughs> artist is, and I'm like, I have no idea, but. Um, it's tough. Uh, for me, uh, I think, I mean, if I had to, if I had to pick one, it would probably be uh, a pile of crowns for Jean-Michel Jean Basquiat. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it's just a really powerful piece. It's a tri It's a huge sort of triangle canvas and it's literally a pile of crowns. Uh, and, and the crown was something that was uh, sort of iconic in Jean-Michel's language. Uh, and, you know, he had just recently lost Jean-Michel suddenly and unexpectedly. Uh, and, and, and it was such a sincere ode to his friend uh, at a time when, you know, Keith was losing many, many friends due to HIV AIDS. Uh, it, it just was a really, really sincere ode. And, and I think it, it hits me. You know, it hits me in that way. I, yeah, if, it's if a great one. I'm, a when favorite? I, I mean, maybe it's that one. No, when I saw that, uh, we, we were at uh, in Melbourne together at that uh, Basquiat Herring show. And when I, I yeah. stopped in front of that painting, I, I cried. It is really such a moving tribute. I mean, for me, uh, Keith is, uh, I don't know if I choose favorite works, but I have certain periods of uh, in his productivity. I love the the early kind of, uh, uh, the um, cut up collages he was, you know, Xeroxing and putting on the street was really great. Right. Like New York Post headlines. I love his, you know, his brief, but very fruitful collaboration with LA two in those years. Mm -hmm. And then the last paintings he was doing uh, all kind of drenched hellish blood red and, and really dealing with mortality. These kind of these, these, these hellish scenes of, of, of uh, kind of massive bodies and orgy uh, thing. Right. That work st still knocks me out. And I don't think it was really appreciated so much at the time and, and probably still very difficult now. So Carlo, for me, the, uh, the elephant in, oh, wait a second, hold on. Do, we, do you have any original pieces that Keith did during his younger years growing up in Pennsylvania? Uh, I'm from the same area as Keith. I do not have pieces uh, from Keith's youth, but they do exist. I mean, there, there are, uh, I've seen uh, friends of his from that time that do have very, very early pieces. I think Kermit uh, Oswald. Uh, who, yes, of course, they, he has they, tons yeah, of, they, uh, they kind of grew up together. And I can't remember what it was, but Kermit told me about, you know, when Keith first heard about graffiti art, he was like, let's go and do graffiti <laughs> went to this like suburban little bridge, you know, and, and I can't remember what he said, but it made like absolutely no sense. It was like about green men or something like that. But right, right. Uh, yeah. So what I was going to say, Carlo, was that the, the elephant in the room about this particular piece about the grace house, I wanted to know what your thoughts were about when a mural such as the grace house is uh, removed from its original context. Uh, I, can, I can certainly tell you that when we first heard that, that the mural was taken out of the building, uh, you know, it was disappointing for us at the foundation. Uh, 
we had, uh, you know, it, it, we obviously have very strong feelings about uh, keeping things uh, sort of intact. You know, we try to keep the work, we preserve the work, we protect it. So we, we uh, you know, we're just really sort of disappointed when, initially when we heard about this thing being removed. I, I kind of wanted to get your thoughts about uh, how you yeah. feel about that sort of thing. Deeply ambivalent, it would be the, the short answer. Uh, <laughs> I remember very, uh, very much at the time how angry I was when people, like this one artist, uh, this guy Richard, I won't say his full name, he actually figured out a way of putting up a fake black background that he could peel off uh, it, when people started removing Keith's work from the subways. Really outraged me, this, this notion that somebody does something for the world and then someone else thinks that because it's for the world they can take it for themselves. And, we were joking earlier about the Banksy effect and how Banksy tries to fight that by by not authenticating the move from the right. street. Um, but then, you know, when Larry did the the show at the uh, Brooklyn Museum, and I and we got to see a bunch of the subway drawings, you kind of also have to be thankful that some of it got saved for posterity so people can see it. Uh, and it's yeah, fraction, that's the rub right a there. muscular project, how much he produced and in such a short time. So uh, with this, um, yeah, it's problematic, especially because uh, people are now seeing it without the staircase. So you don't really get the sense of space that he has. Um, but it's also, um, it's a bit of a salvage, you know, and, and thank, thankfully, you know, so many things do get lost that we do have room for things that get saved. And it sure makes it better that uh, whoever got it was, was generous enough <laughs> And uh, immediately allow. Um, I think Keith, Keith would not be rolling over in, in his grave over that particular one. Well, I mean, yeah, I, you know, knowing Keith the way I did, he'd be jumping up and down and, and upset about yeah. it being removed. Yeah. Um, but you know, as you say, it it is uh, an opportunity. And, and listen, we're we're grateful to uh, the person that did purchase it. Uh, and we're grateful that the intent was to display these things in, in the public. Um, my feeling is that, you know, these works or this particular work was, was made uh, with the spirit of generosity, right? It was the spirit of generosity of, of Keith. And, you know, listen, we, we at the foundation do not know the identity of the of the owner but i would extend an invitation to the owner to uh perhaps consider uh you know a donation to the not to the herring foundation but to the uh, ali forney center uh the ali forney center was actually going to we were hoping to to sort of make a match to buy this building to keep the mural intact. Uh, and because it was the church that owned it, because Ali Forney is, a, uh, is an organization that houses homeless gay kids, uh, it dissolved. And then fast forward a, a year or two later, we hear that the mural is, is uh, you know, removed and sold and this is not. So, I, you know, again, for me, you know, in the spirit of Keith Haring, I would invite the owner to participate in that uh, generous spirit and perhaps consider uh, a donation to the Alley Forney Center. Yeah, well said. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, because uh, that's a big part of the foundation. Uh, I remember uh, when the uh, staircase you showed at the Children's Hospital in Paris, I remember when that was restored. I've, I've, we just at crack as whack just got restored. Um, the, the uh, gay and lesbian center in uh, LGBTQ center now uh, is yeah. in New York. Uh, when, when that went through restoration, so a lot of what you're trying to do is actually preserving these otherwise ephemeral public works. So, uh, how much of that is going on, and, and how is that done? I mean, you said it. We, we do. When we are aware of murals 
and, and we pretty much know where they are and where they still are. Uh, you know, we had one in, in uh, Amsterdam where that was covered for 30 years with some metal cladding uh, and the cladding was removed and, you know, sure enough, there's this, uh, there's this huge uh, sort of sea beast uh, on, the, on the wall of the, uh, I want to say it's the Stedlik, of what used to be the Stedlik yeah. Museum. So, you know, we, we do try to uh, actively preserve these things. Uh, we, we have uh, some experts, uh, Will Shank, uh, who has probably been involved in most of the restorations that we are, that we, uh, are involved in. And we do try to preserve them. Yeah, it's great. It's really great when they come back to life. Uh, in New York, we're really fortunate to how many we have. And it's really, uh, it, it's amazing through time how everyone just takes possession of them. It becomes part of people's lives. And from kids to old people to everyone, it's just, it's, it's everyone. Yeah, people, it's a, it's a huge point of pride. I mean, I know, I know crack is whack. Uh, I'm from the neighborhood. I'm from uh, Spanish Harlem. And I know crack is, the crack is whack mural is a, it is a, it is a point of pride for the neighborhood. Uh, it, it was most recently restored, I want to say last year, or the year before, obviously before COVID. And uh, this year actually marks uh, its, its 35th birthday. It was done in 86. So this is the, the 35th uh, anniversary of, of Crack is Whack. Yeah, so, you know, it, just like for instance one, because that was covered up during the whole restoration uh, uh, process. And then uh, the first time driving down FDR uh, Drive, but when it, it, you could see it again, it was like, it was sort of like a, a really dear friend coming back into everyone's life. Yeah, I think, I mean, that, it was actually covered up. It was actually covered up because they were doing construction on the, uh, oh, okay. on the bridge there. So yeah, they oh, covered right. it up to help, uh, so it wouldn't be damaged. Nice. But uh, yeah. I think we have time for another question if you got one on hand. All right. Um, this is for, you can read this, right? Uh, yeah. But maybe uh, not everyone. Can everyone see this, I wonder? Uh, well, the question is, lots of Keith's art has been showing up in mainstream merchandise recently. Do you think this kind of thing contributes to his democratization of art? Does it take away at all from the messaging? Uh, we, I, get, I get that all the time. I get that question all the time. And, you know, the licensing of Keats imagery for clothing and, and that sort of thing is very much in line with what he did and what he wanted. Um, so to answer the question, yes, it is, it, it is very much in line with his you know, with, with uh, his idea of making his art accessible. Uh, so that I think is, is it's, it's, it's a way to, it's a way that if somebody cannot afford a, a print or a painting, uh, they can have a t-shirt. It's still the same ethos as, as a pop shop. Yeah, and that was kind of, the pop shop was the whole thing is like, I can make a painting for at that time, maybe it would be $10,000 or I can make 10,000 t-shirts and I'd rather 10,000 people have. He was very, you know, that was very much his Which philosophy. was a radical, very radical idea at the time, and, especially and not, in the art world. And not everything you see in a museum gift shop is appropriate. Some of it's really cringy, uh, but I think the way you <laughs> with art star on these things, very much in key spirit. I love it. I think yeah. we should wrap it up and thank you so much, Gil. It's a treat to talk to you. It is a treat to talk about Keith Herring. Thank you for the for the warm invitation, MCA Denver, Carlo. Thank you for yeah. you know doing. And this then I just want to uh, remind people. Uh, I almost forgot, and I would have been in trouble. That we're going to have another conversation on March twenty fourth, which uh, goes very well with this one. It's with a really great artist, Swoon, who's worked a lot on the streets in in public art, but uh, a big part of uh, of of her creative energy is, is with the same generosity that, that Keith uh, showed throughout his career. She, she does uh, housing in Haiti and just so many projects really for the people and, uh, and, and really like uh, for as much for free as, 
as you can imagine. So please join us on the 24th. And I think there should be a button where you can subscribe to uh, the MCA Denver's YouTube channel. And that way you don't have to forget it like I do most things going on. <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks, Gil. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Thank you. Much Thanks, love. everyone.